just knew there was going to be pizza for uh, lunch, so I thought I'd go back to this rather old video. I don't know if you've seen that. Uh, that was around in 2009, under a slightly different legal regime, but it brought to the point why people started to be worried about privacy. So I'm just playing this, and is the uh, sound supposed to be on? Okay. Yes, that's the order. This is Mr. Kelly? Uh, yes. Thank you for calling again, sir. I share your national identification number as 610204999A-45-54610. Is that correct? Uh, yes. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. I see you with a 736 Montrose Corp, which you're calling from your cell phone. Are you at home? I'm just leaving work, but I'm... Oh, we can deliver to Bob's Auto Supply. That's at 175 Lincoln Avenue, yes? No, no. I'm on my way home. How do you know all that? We just got wired into this. Well... I'd like to order a couple of your double meat special pieces. Sure thing. There'll be a new $20 charge for this, sir. What do you mean? Sir, the system shows me that your medical records indicate that you have high blood pressure and extremely high cholesterol. Luckily, we have a new agreement with your national health care provider that does not to you double the time. You want to agree to waive all your and liability. What? Do you agree, sir? You can sign the form when we deliver, but there is a charge for processing. It's only $67. $67? That includes the delivery surcharge of $15 to cover the address to our driver of traveling through an orange zone. I live in an orange zone? Now you do. Looks like there was another robbery on Montrose yesterday. Hmm. You could pay $40 if you ordered our special spread submarine combo and you said yourself. Comes with tofu sticks, so they're very tasty, sir. Good diet. I want double meat. Well, I'm sure you can afford the $67 then. You just bought those tickets from Hawaii. They weren't cheap then. But I think you checked out the budget beach phone of the library last week. Hmm. Up to you, sir. All right, all right. I'll get the sprout sauce. Good choice, sir. Gotta watch that waist if you're hitting the beach, eh? 42 inches. Wow. Maybe you take open sprouts is like required. That's how much? Just between you and me. There's a $3 total man fitness night. Your wife Betty subscribes to that, right? Anyhow, put that at 1999 dollars Oh, looks like you maxed out on all your credit cards. Bring cash, okay? Mm -hmm. Wanna stop this from happening? <laughs> so, <laughs> that was uh, from 2009. Um, and uh, at the time, people thought that the Data Protection Directive was going to be sufficient to deal with that and prevent that future from happening. Um, increasingly, people realized that was uh, slightly on the over-optimistic side. Uh, come on. Up. Okay, clicker is working. Yeah, um, just a little bit of background. Um, I don't know what the rules of the competition are. But if you need some last minute legal advice, I will be online tomorrow uh, most of the time. So uh, that is a, a, an option. Uh, another thing on a personal note, there's another hackathon starting on the 9th of July, uh, organized by the law school with a database of uh, peace negotiations and uh, international treaties and conflict zones. So if you are interested to team up with uh, a couple of lawyers to find out what to do with that sort of database, again, drop me an email and uh, I'll send you the, the sign-in details. That will be from the 9th to the 12th of uh, July. Um, just a little bit of background. Some of the things that I'm going to talk to you about will be generic introduction to GDPR, data protection and privacy. Uh, some of it will be based on some very current experiences uh, that I made. Some of it just a few days ago. Uh, this morning I came back on a delayed flight from Brussels. The European Commission has now started three different expert groups to look into AI and regulation. One on AI and ethics. So not looking just at the legal side, but at the post-compliance, the ethical issues. Uh, a separate working group run by the European Commission on uh, liability and AI and a third group, a high-level expert group on AI run not by the Commission, by the European Parliament, which will try to get a sort of overall uh, picture on the regulatory landscape of machine learning and artificial intelligence. And we submitted just last week a report to the German Ministry of Justice 
on AI, machine learning, and uh, consumer protection. And some of the issues about fairness will be things that are popping up both on the consumer protection side and also on the um, data protection side. Of course, if you think about it, um, if you think back about uh, the, the example you just heard about the pizza delivery, um, it's very clear what it tries to achieve. It uh, was, after all, developed at the time by um, the uh, open rights group, so privacy cautious people who, who want more protection. But you could ask yourself, what was it really that upsets up about it? What was, if any, the inherent unfairness uh, that happened to this guy? Why was he treated wrongly? And once you start to analyze what exactly it is that might be bothering you, you might start to realize, well, both from the legal side and from the ethical side, things are actually not quite that straightforward and, and, and quite that easy. So for instance, he doesn't get his double meat pizza. He is recommended a broccoli and sprout pizza with tofu sticks. And while we might sympathize with him and feel, well, yeah, tough deal, once you start to think about it, look at the newspaper uh, reports, obesity crisis in Scotland, um, a apparently se serious crisis uh, looming ahead on the west coast, our friends in Glasgow. The cemeteries, the mortuaries are not any longer big enough to do incineration of people because they were built for slightly thinner folks. So we face as a society potentially a problem here. And you could say, well, isn't it unfair that the reasonable people, those who choose to eat broccoli pizza in the first place, should through their premiums subsidize the lifestyle of this totally uh, reckless guy. Is that not a piece of unfairness? And once you go down that route, you realize that this is becoming a discussion in various societies. One of the running mates of Donald Trump, I don't know, remember which one it was, uh, they all come across as equally ridiculous, so it becomes difficult to make these fine-grained distinctions. But he actually went on a public podium and made an argument very similar to that. He said, isn't it terribly unfair that under this communist Obama healthcare system, people who never fall ill through their premium subsidize people who get cancer? At which point I said, look, you are a total idiot. You don't understand what the purpose of an insurance is. Insurance is about distributing risk. It's about solidarity. Yes, I know I might not benefit from it, but I buy peace of mind because I know the risk is now spread out. It's not any longer just my risk. It's everybody's risk, so we help each other. And that is an element of fairness. It is unfair to penalize me for getting cancer. It's not my choice or losing a leg in an accident or falling uh, ill in some other way. So in one view of fairness, it is fair to disregard certain characteristics and penalize people for them, getting cancer or having an accident. In a different view on fairness, it is unfair to make people who take different uh, risky life choices responsible or uh, liable for those who don't. So uh, once you start to unpack the notion of fairness underlying some of these assumptions, you realize things can become very quickly slightly more complicated on that specific issue. I know where my analysis would come down, but it's not totally straightforward what the correct answer would be. Now, what law does to a certain extent is to preempt some of these discussions. It says, well, you might all disagree of what is really fair in that position, but we as a society made some basic choices that are simply not any longer open for negotiations. And some of them uh, directly through data protection law affected the scenario that I was just giving you. So data protection law essentially says there might all be fairness arguments in favor of um, reshifting the balance of risk taking in our health system, but you must not do it at the expenses of data protection. There are certain lines in the sand that you simply mustn't cross. So one of the interesting things that you have to consider as you are working in this field is what are the baselines that the law requires from us? And what can we do beyond that, beyond compliance, past compliance, to realize the ethical intuitions that are underlying the specific legal regulation? That's where it really becomes interesting, because there the answers are not any longer totally straightforward. So what does the GDPR have to say about all this? Um, Previous speaker, I think, said you've all received 25 emails per day asking you to resubscribe to certain 
disk lists or newsletters, you probably totally forgot that you ever subscribed to them in the first place. Um, my personal advice, when you get one of these, don't resubscribe. Why not? Well, the GDPR does not actually require anything substantially new. The GDPR consolidates and makes slightly more precise things that already under the Data Protection Directive uh, were deemed to be reasonable and appropriate. If a company says, oh, the laws have changed, we now have to do things differently, then they essentially screwed you over in the past. So sending people a GDPR renewal request is a good indication that there are some serious flaws uh, in their approach so far. So they're probably not the sort of people you would want to trust with your data. And I uh, get a much less cluttered in inbox as a result of that. So uh, what does the GDPR say? Well, the first thing uh, that is important here and that causes quite a bit of concern also on the techie side is simply the scope of data protection law. Article 4.1 says that personal data means any information relating to an identified or identifiable natural person. An identifiable natural person is one who can be identified directly or indirectly, in particular by reference to an identifier such as name, number, location data, online identifier, and so on and so forth. So in principle, there are certain things the GDPR from the very beginning does not deal with. <coughs> One of it is every data that is not personal data. Does it mean that data is not personal, that it is ethically and legally uh, safe to use? No, absolutely not. Some data might not be personal data, but it might be owned by someone else. And if you want to use it, you're not falling foul of data protection law, you're simply falling foul of intellectual property law, copyright law, for instance. Or it might be a state secret, and suddenly you get guys in badly uh, tailored suits in a dark car being on front of your door knocking at the door and saying, well, actually, this type of satellite image was not something you were supposed to be using. But what about fairness? Can we be uh, unfair, unjust to people uh, simply by using non-personalized data? Well, I think you can. Um, imagine a data project that tries to predict flooding in the UK. And that data is then used by insurance companies to determine insurance premium for dwellings. The data model itself won't contain any personal data. It's all about rainfall uh, in, in, in the UK. The implications for people not being any longer able to afford their homes can be dramatic, but it won't be because personal data was used. If that model is flawed, if for some reason or other it is not an accurate model, then these people might very well feel treated unfairly. And especially if the reason that the data model is flawed has to do with social inequalities. So for instance, if you have people who are well connected, middle class, know people in local councils, and make sure that the measuring places for rainfall are where they live, and people in poorer regions who don't have that social capital, can't flex their muscles like that, don't get the measuring stations, then you might very well end up with a data model that systematically discriminates against poorer neighborhoods. Again, not a GDPR problem. Deeply, deeply unfair, deeply, deeply worrying, but not something that the GDPR prima facie can help you with. The problem is here in some other field. Um, someone or something else that is not covered, to the dismay of some people I know, animals are not covered, only natural people. Um, I don't know if you followed the drama about the Edinburgh pandas uh, borrowed to us, or lent to us from uh, the Chinese government as a uh, rather expensive goodwill gesture, cost us 600,000 pounds per year apparently, when they were in uh, their mating uh, season and there was a possibility at least that they were going to have offspring, people switched off the panda camps. And I still don't quite understand that. Uh, I mean, in the UK, we have the highest coverage of CCTV cameras in the Western world. And apparently, concern about CCTV is relatively low. Why they switched on the panda ca uh, camps when the pandas were about to have sex? Search me. But that happened. True. Uh, but it had nothing to do with the GDPR. Whatever people might tell you, this was not privacy going mad. Uh, there might have been some other reasons. Um, but also is not covered, and that becomes slightly more problematic, are dead people. Once you are dead, you are losing your rights under the GDPR. The GDPR has a provision that uh, member states are allowed 
to extend privacy protection to dead people. Some of them have done so. Uh, Italy is in the process, Germany has done so, Hungary I think is going to, as the UK hasn't. So in the UK, the moment you are dead, you are losing your privacy protections. Is that a concern? You are dead after all, why would you worry? Well, think about the relatives. They might want to preserve a specific image of a beloved father or a husband. And they might not want the next day to get splashed over all over the sun, um, porn shocker, in Pastor's mansion, the recently deceased archbishop was found with lots and lots of panda porn on his computer <laughs> that he illegally got when hacking into the panda cam of Edinburgh Zoo. Uh, that might be a huge dis embarrassment for uh, the relatives. They might be extremely upset about that. But at least under the UK version of the GDPR, uh, there is nothing you can do about this. So when you ask yourself, is this a privacy issue? First thing to ask, is this actually personal data. If it isn't, not GDPR territory. <coughs> Second question you should ask yourself, is my client the police? If it is the police, not GDPR territory. There's a specific directive, the policing directive, but the GDPR excludes policing and secret services. It deals exclusively with commercial use of data. Um, not totally correct. If you work for the police, and the police uses your product for managerial purposes, deciding on promotion of police officers, uh, performance evaluation, that sort of thing, then the police simply acts as a normal employee and would be covered. Uh, but the moment it is about law enforcement, the moment it is about investigation, you need to look at a different legal system. So that is what the GDPR is not about. The next question is what is personal data? And that is one of the really, really difficult things that has tremendously changed over the last couple of years, primarily uh, thanks to you lot. Uh, there was a time that it was relatively clear what personal data was. It was your name associated with some sort of properties. But increasingly, if you look at uh, what the um, GDPR says here, um, directly or indirectly, it became clear that it is not any longer sufficient to direct, protect directly personal data, uh, it became necessary to protect data from which it is possible to back infer the identity of an individual, even if the individual data sets do not hold personal data. So you might have a set of data that correlates people who eat pizza with broccoli and are customers of that specific service delivery company. They are not personal data because there's at this point not per per personal data in there yet. But then you have another piece of data that shows how often that company refused the request for a meat pizza because of the health advice they got. And once you combine these different data sets, even though they individually might not have personal identifiable data, you become able of drilling down to an individual and identify them. And that is one of the big conundrums and no one at the moment as a convincing answer. Um, you might have heard this under the keyword of differential privacy. There are increasingly attempts made to protect the anonymity of the data subject in a data set. But the big problem that we are facing is if you combine too many data sets and if you use them too often, the chances are that even the data you are dealing with looks harmless and not personal, ultimately under that definition that does cover indirectly identifiable data, you are after all uh, in trouble. So if you are doing a risk analysis, don't ask yourself just, is for that specific purpose the data identifiable? You have to ask yourself as well, once I have collected that data, would someone else who has another data set be able to find out who the people are I'm dealing with just by combining them uh, and uh, enriching that data set? Um, one way around this, as I said, is uh, to avoid personal data. Anonymization is uh, one of the methods. So if you have truly anonymous data, truly anonymized data, then you are outside the scope of the GDPR. And just a little dialogue. The first person who identifies where it is from, shout out, who are you? No one of consequence. I must know. 
get used to disappointment. Anyone identifies the best ever movie from which these lines are? Any, any takers? Hmm? Yes, of course, The Princess Bride, I must know. Um, and here we see an especially efficient way of anonymizing data. No one ever could possibly find out who this guy is who cunningly has camouflaged himself by wearing a dark mask over his eyes, leaving the entire rest of his uh, facial features totally open and also not changing his voice or anything like that. Um, CCTV camera with facial recognition would probably be able to spot who he is, uh, finishing the film rather prematurely. Um, so yes, one of the problems with anonymity is we had to realize that we need to get used to disappointment, that increasingly our techniques for anonymization do not um, keep track of our speed in which we can de-anonymize data uh, in the arms race, the anonymization seem always to be a step ahead. So the best we can probably aim for is pseudonymization and the data protection regulation gives actually some bonuses for pseudo pseudonymous data. You are covered by the scope. Anonymous data means GDPR doesn't apply. Pseudonymous data means it applies, but you probably did the right thing. So everything else after that is probably going to be okay if you use the right pseudonymization method and it is strong enough. Um, so assume for the purpose of the talk, we decided the data you are dealing with is either uh, personal data directly or it could be re used for re-identification purposes. So we assume um, that the law uh, applies. What are the rules then? Well, essentially two things must now be met. Firstly, the processing of the data must be lawful. And secondly, it must be fair. So these are the two things that also I think the project or the, the hackathon you were concerned with try to unpack a little bit. There are two different criteria. Lawfulness means are you allowed to do anything with that data in the first place? Second thing, the fairness issue is, is what you are then doing with it acceptable and okay? Um, on the first one, the data protection regulation, just as the data protection directive, in marked difference from the American approach, for instance, starts with the assumption, if it is personal data, you should not analyze it. The Americans go the other way around. They say, if it is data and you own that data, you have access to that data, you can do something with it unless you screw up badly. So there's a presumption uh, for usage restricted by uh, making a major mess of it. The European approach is the opposite. It says initially the default is personal data, keep your hands off. You're only allowed to do anything with it if you have one of the lawful grounds. And that is essentially what Article 6 says and which is the reason why you all got these annoying emails. Because the first one of these is consent. Uh, if the data subject agrees that you do something with the data, then you have one of the lawful grounds of data processing. And that then results in annoying emails and to have to scroll through 50 pages of legalese uh, where you realize that subsection 215 actually allowed them to do all sorts of horrible things with it. Um, the consent fetishism that many people were worried about even in the old G, uh, data protection directive. What the GDPR now does is to say, well, we really mean that. This is not just any longer a formal requirement. We really mean if people are fine with it. And that requires two things. They have really understood <coughs> what is going on. So the consent must be informed. They can't just say, here we have 200 pages of policy and they agreed on it. No, you, they really must have understood what is going on. And they must have been given this consent freely. And freely really means freely here not induced by necessity. If all of your friends are on Facebook and losing your Facebook account essentially means you become a social pariah and you lose uh, every contact you ever had in the world, then you do not consent freely for them processing your data. You are just any longer in a position to do that. The unequal distribution of bargaining power sees to that. And one of the big differences in spirit between the GDPR and the old law was to take that serious and to say we need to look at the specific uh, circumstances and ask ourselves how powerful 
are the people you are dealing here with? Can they simply go to a competitor that deals with their data better? Can they circumvent the demands they made from you? Or are they at your mercy? And if they are at your mercy, then consent becomes a problem. And you have to go much, much more careful about uh, getting the right type of consent. So listening to some of your examples you were giving in the pitches, um, most of you were not trying to leverage data of ordinary customers for some other purpose. So the balance of power is probably fine. But that is the problem Facebook is facing. Yeah? If you become a monopoly, if it becomes so important for you to continue to run your small business, to keep in touch with your friends, that you have no choice, no real choice, then the fact that you had a purely legal choice is not any longer sufficient. At the same time, uh, we should note that uh, Article 61A is only one of the six reasons for processing. There are others. Consent is not always required. Consent is, for instance, not required um, when um, it's part of the contractual performance. If you go to your GP and your GP asks you, um, where does your back hurt? Then you shouldn't say, under data protection, I'm not supposed to tell you. You are supposed to diagnose me without me telling you anything about my symptoms. There you are. Now, I want from you a correct diagnosis of why I'm splitting blood and I'm not going to tell you anything. Now, that would be obviously stupid. <laughs> you could try to deal with it under consent, but again, power imbalance, you're about to die, your GP is in a powerful situation, consent might not work, but here comes in need to perform a contract and uh, you are covered and in the clear. That is just one of these examples. Sometimes in order to perform a contract, you have to give people data. If you call an Uber, disclosing your location is something you simply have to do because otherwise your Uber won't find you. Yeah? Evoking data protection law at this point seems silly. So very sensibly, uh, 6B says that there's another reason for processing data. Processing is in compliance for legal obligation. If you have an online business, you need to store customer data. And you need to store the customer data for longer than is necessary to deliver the contract because you have to pay your taxes. And you have to prove that uh, you accounted for all the income you had, for instance. So sometimes there might be another legal obligation. Now, one of your groups, for instance, uh, was looking at uh, discrimination uh, in hiring situations. Question is, how long can we keep data of rejected applicants? If I want to find out if my hiring practices are law compliant, if they are fair, then I also have to store data of people that I have rejected. Because I want to know how many women did I reject, how many uh, ethnic minority applicants did I reject. So I have to keep data that at that point in time, the data subject doesn't consent to any longer. They are pissed off, they didn't get the job. Uh, it's also not necessary to perform the contract. I didn't give them a contract. That's the whole problem. <laughs> they didn't get the job. But I have to show to the Equality Commission that my hiring practices are lawful. That's a legal requirement. So here I'm allowed to process this data and keep it even if it is not uh, covered by consent or necessary to perform the contract. So if you are making an analysis of the legality of your project, don't just stop at consent. Consent is not always necessary and you might have a different ground. But also don't say consent is just we tell them click this uh, very, very lengthy form. Consent now actually means something. So that is what makes data processing lawful. And then it has to be fair. And that's where it really gets murky and really, really complicated. And matching what computer scientists and statisticians understand as fair with what lawyers understand as fair is an unresolved problem. Uh, we tried to do it for one year now with an interdisciplinary research group of very, very good statisticians and very, very good lawyers. And even after a year, most of the time, we sit around the table and say, what on earth are you talking about? What do you mean this algorithm is biased? Uh, what do you mean with that is actually unfair? Uh, and the reasons are, um, well, firstly, that the notion of fairness that the GDPR uses is um, limited for historical and contextual reasons. A potential risk involved for the interest and rights of the data subject and that prevents inter alia discriminatory effects on natural persons 
on the basis of racial and ethnic origin, political opinion, religion or beliefs, trade union membership, genetic or health status, or sexual orientation. So you have here two groups that are specifically protected. Conversely, the law says lots of discrimination are okay as long as they are not one of these six groups. Now there is nothing in these six groups that singles them out from a mathematical perspective or a computation perspective. You need to understand about our history, about our society, about our culture to understand these are problematic. And then you look at them and you realize they can be problematic for two very, very different reasons. They can be problematic because we know that they are very often the victim of discrimination. And if they are discriminated against, the social consequences are particularly bad. So we know in job interviews, discrimination against women for top jobs is a continuing problem. We know that because Google's job recommender tends to recommend you $300,000 plus jobs only if you are a man and uh, recommends you cleaning jobs when you are a woman, statistically speaking at least. Uh, so we know that even the Google algorithm has picked up on continuing practices of discrimination in our society. Now, that's a concern. We know that it is probably going on and it has quite a substantial impact. It might well be that uh, we also discriminate against people or in favor of people who have a nose that is slightly more upturned, you know, of course it's cute. Uh, I always, in, uh, sorry, I'm too much information, I realize that for data protection purposes, but there might be certain patterns of attractiveness, for instance, that play for some people more than others. Not listed here, therefore as far as the law is concerned, fine. Probably simply not because they are more fair, but because we say, look, this is so marginal that as a society we are not worried about this. So fairness, intuitively, goes beyond what the law requires here. The law makes a risk assessment and simply says certain groups are particularly at risk. And if people screw up, the consequences for society are particularly bad. Therefore, we single them out. One reason. The other reason is, and that's especially in the US context, uh, these are sometimes groups that have been discriminated against in the past. So they don't start on a level playing field. That's a different justification. It requires you to do slightly different things when you look at your algorithms. If you are worried about current discrimination, you only need to look at the outcome and see is the outcome uh, dis distributed fairly. If you are worried also about past discrimination, you can have a biased outcome which is nonetheless more fair. There we are the territory of positive discrimination and how much that is legitimate and acceptable. So it depends a little bit why we think that these groups uh, deserve particular protection to determine what treatment is fair. There's a very famous saying by Anatole France from the beginning of the 19th century that our laws are totally fair. They prohibit hobos and millionaires from sleeping under the bridge. And he wanted to show the inherent unfairness of something that looked like a fair rule, fair on the surface of it, non-discriminatory on the surface, but which nonetheless was deeply discriminatory in application. More, more modern legal examples are breastfeeding. Uh, some uh, local uh, municipal powers in the US argued that their laws against breastfeeding were totally facially neutral and non-discriminatory because they prohibited everyone from breastfeeding, men and women and therefore could not possibly be discriminatory. And the lawyers, fortunate enough, said, look, people, you are silly. Um, this is not how it is supposed to work. So um, if your concerns are along these lines, you sometimes might engineer a biased outcome because it serves on the level of fairness the overarching societal good. And that makes it difficult sometimes to spot suspicion purely statistical means if discrimination is going on. So again, some of you have suggested that we can use statistical tools to find out if there's discrimination. Yes, but be careful. Um, one and the same distribution of outcomes can be fair under one category and one understanding of fairness and deeply unfair under another. Um, fairness requires that the data is accurate. So you have to ask yourself, can I trust my own data? And if not, can I remedy it? 
Can I correct data? How easy do I make it to people to complain? Um, in India, there's a fascinating um, political party, I think in the southern parts of India. It's a party of the dead. And it really exists. It's a party of people who have officially been declared dead. And that is sometimes because of simple mistakes, sometimes as a result of corruption. So you have uh, some relatives who want your land and they bribe a local official and then you are declared dead and your land is taken over. And that has become such a problem that they now form political lobby groups because it is so difficult to rectify the mistake. You can stand in front of the official and jump up and down. I'm feeling really, really good. There's a Monty Python sketch, I think, when, when, when they collect the dead people after, after the plague. And one of them says, I'm, I'm still very, very healthy. And then he gets one of the head and isn't quite as healthy any longer. Um, it's sometimes really difficult to convince officials that they made a mistake. And the GDPR says this is also part of fairness. Fairness involves correcting your mistakes and allowing people to correct them relatively straightforward and easily. And as I said, they are very much content dependent and specific to the specific application. There's special category data. I mentioned that already. There are certain data we find particularly problematic. Uh, racial or ethnic origin, political opinion, so on and so forth. Here you find another problem. As I said, these are context specific, they are social problems, they are political issues, and therefore they differ from country to country. There is one group in here that is not quite like the others, internationally speaking. Um, which one would you say in light of current events uh, is different here? when it comes to discrimination and um, sensitivity. We have ethnic or racial origin, political opinions, religious or philosophical beliefs, trade union membership, genetical data, sex life or sexual orientation. There is one category in here that we find in Europe, but not in the US as events last week would have shown you. Political opinion. Political, political opinion, yeah, exactly, precisely. You're not supposed under the GDPR to discriminate against people on grounds of their political opinion unless there is a sound reason to override this. So if, for instance, you have an online platform that registers people for a political party, um, yes, you are allowed to ask, uh, are you actually in favor of what this party is all about? That's fine, but again, that is necessary to perform a contract. Uh, but political opinion and discrimination on political opinion, Europe has said we are not totally happy with that. America, if you happen to be uh, the mildly racist uh, secretary of state to the deeply racist president, and you're suddenly not any longer served in a restaurant because people don't like you, then that is a fair expression of their freedom to contract and constitutionally protect it. So you have to ask yourself, what is here actually my customer basis? Where do I'm going to sell this? Uh, in the US, certain things would be, even if they are discriminatory, okay, for data protection purposes, uh, which they aren't in Europe, where a slightly different choice was made. How are we with time? When should I stop? Well, I didn't look at the, given the, how late we were. I didn't look at the time when you started, but when you feel that this is really out of I can do this for hours, you know. Uh, <laughs> you, you know, an, another favorite of my films, they shoot horses, don't they? It's a dance marathon. I always thought I can do that for academics. I, I would really like to see how long can I talk without stopping. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's been 40 minutes. Okay. So um, I, I, will, I will wrap up very quickly. I'm, I'm not going to talk you through the slides, uh, unfortunately not. But on the one hand, you are already relatively late into the marathon. I can also distribute the slides if there is a method for this. But one of the things me and um, um, a friend of mine from St. Andrews, a computer scientist, did uh, was to look at uh, operationalizing this for product development. So if you have a neural network, then you obviously have an output layer, where the results comes out. You have a hidden layer where the magic happens. The algorithms are, uh, most of them pretty banal uh, 
statistical regressions, but if you tell politicians they are algorithms, their eyes light up and they get mystified. And then you have the input layer uh, where, where you feed in the data. And you can desegregate the rather complex uh, GDPR for purposes that I think work better for you lot when it comes to the design stage by asking which of these three different categories is affected by what type of legislation. So for instance, um, there's an article that says you have to inform your customers about the existence of automated profiling and the logic of automated profiling. And it seems that that involves all the three layers. You have to tell them, this is a type of data I'm using. This is broadly speaking what we do with it, without having to go into too much detail. And this is the type of things we then do with it. So article 15 involves all three layers. Uh, the logic, however, again, article 15, that is essentially the hidden layer. And one of the open discussions is just how deep do you have to go into disclosing what is going on there? How much of it is still permissible to keep secret under trade secret law? How much do you have to disclose? Uh, you probably only have to say this algorithm establishes al correlations between these different categories, something along these lines. Output layer, human intervention. Um, Article 22 gives uh, your clients or citizens a specific right if a decision was purely automated. Now, whether or not it counts as purely automated as purpose for data protection law, that has only to do with the way you design the output layer and how you integrate it in the decision-making process of a company. Data protection by design, uh, that is the new obligation to use the best available technological tools to make your product as safe and secure as possible, that essentially affects primarily the way the law sees it, the training layer. Is my training data set uh, representative? Is there already a bias hidden in the initial training from which the AI can then pick up bad habits? Uh, is the data accurate that I feed into the system? And also um, on the output layer, have I anonymized correctly? Are my methods of data security appropriate? Do I keep the data separate from other data sets? Do I grant the right access rights? So Article 25, if you check for compliance, um, you essentially have these two layers. Certification doesn't concern us here. That will happen at a later stage where someone will come and say, your product is safe. And that will then cover all three layers. Um, but that gives you a little bit of a, I think, methodological or structured guideline. When you ask yourself for your product, where are the risk factors? What should I be concerned about? Should I be concerned about the input layer? There are essentially four or five articles in the GDPR that now tell me what to do. That's my worry. Everything I do afterwards, state of the art, uh, simply reuse of existing technologies. Or am I worried about the middle layer? Am I worried about the training? What can go wrong there? Well, that's where you're in the discrimination territory. Uh, how certain can you be that um, you deal with the data in appropriate ways and robust ways? Uh, essentially two articles relevant here. And then the output layer, how do I use this data? Uh, in what format do I communicate it um, to the citizens or to the customers? So that gives you a little bit of a framework in which you can think through your project and ask yourself, where are the parts that potentially fall foul of the GDPR? Um, and I think, do I still have some joke left? Ah, yeah, very, very briefly. Um, I also want to tell you, ask you, um, remind you that fairness is not just a data protection issue. Fairness is something that comes up in lots and lots of different parts of the law. And it can mean very, very different things. So you might want to be data, or you have to be data protection law compliant, but you might have to be compliant with all sorts of laws. Remember that one, Life of Brian, haggling. Uh, <laughs> in some cultures, haggling is perfectly OK. There was a uh, recent advertising clip with the Iranian uh, comedian, what was his name, I always forget it. But he said, well, do you know how they call in my country people who can't haggle? We call them English. Uh, yeah. Simply showing, look, you are stupid, uh, an intelligent person haggles. And one big concern in terms of algorithm and the law is, is price discrimination. Is price discrimination OK? If the other side, through my browsing behavior, finds out I'm desperate to get that flight, I looked at it, 
two hours ago. Then I went to lots and lots of other price comparison websites and didn't find something. Then I come back, oh, you are probably desperate. Let's increase the price a little bit. As the equivalent of the old, my children will starve unless you uh, pay for that price. The law says this is basically okay. Price discrimination is at the moment not yet illegal, but there are at least three different initiatives, both on UK level and European Union level, that rethink that and ask ourselves, well, Sometimes price discrimination is fine, but if it becomes abusive, it becomes unfair. Um, if your ship is sinking and another guy with a ship comes along and says, how much exactly do you want to pay me to rescue you? Then that is not any longer a fair contract. And uh, the UK law on unfair contracts essentially was born in the 19th century on salvage of goods at sea. If you are exploiting a weakness too much, you are suddenly in trouble. So fairness in contract law means something slightly different from fairness in data protection law. And at the moment that is shifting, which if you think about sustainability and your business model might be an issue. Things are likely to happen here, partly because of these guys, Uber, yeah? Anyone seen that? Your normal fare would have been $13, but because of surch surcharge, uh, eight times as much, uh, that was when there was um, heavy rainstorms in Pittsburgh that simply closed down the entire transport system. People were suddenly asked to pay nine times as much. And Uber said, this is simply demand and supply. Tough. There are only so many cars, uh, so much demand. We can charge as much as the market requires. Pittsburgh and some other cities said, no, that is actually abusive. You are abusing here, just like in my, in my ship example, the vulnerability of poor people. You can't do that. So here we have a discussion, is that not becoming unfair? Here's an additional problem here. Um, who sets the algorithm? Who decides how much you have to pay? According to Uber, no. Strangely enough, according to Uber, they have no employees. They have people who happen to use their online platform to organize their business, but are self-employed. So according to Uber, it's the individual driver and the algorithm who decides on that, but not Uber centrally. So they said it has nothing to do with us. They thought they were extremely clever because they said, well, look, not us, it's our drivers. The problem with that is, oh, nope, I don't have another slide with that. If every driver uses the same algorithm, they all come to the same result. Yeah? And that is a cartel, as we competition lawyers call it. So Uber alone making a higher price would have been legal. Lots and lots of drivers individually using the same algorithm to come to the same price, that, my dear, is a cartel. And that can get you into criminal law um, because that is a uh, agreement to manipulate the market price. So essentially Pittsburgh went back to Uber and said, look, Honey, you have a choice here. <laughs> you either accept responsibility and you stop this and you accept that these people are employed by you and you direct them and it is your price. And then you don't do it in the future and you give us a bit of money or we come with an organized crime uh, charge against all your drivers individually. Do you want that? And strange enough, uh, Uber said, oh, actually, yes, uh, we, we, we reconsidered our position. But here you get another problem, uh, another fairness problem. Sometimes it is okay if you do it on your own. But if your algorithm is used by lots and lots of people, the cumulative result can be unfair. So you have to ask yourself as well, if everyone would be doing it as, as I propose now, if my algorithm is used by everyone, is that sustainable? Or do we get systemic unfairness um, simply by uh, everyone using it? And then finally, uh, that became very popular, uh, powerful, a sentencing support system used in the US that decides about how long people are supposed to serve in prison. It uh, mines historical data to predict reoffending. Some of the historical data came from pre-civil rights Alabama. Uh, lo and behold, the algorithm came to racist uh, decisions about the sentencing. If you were a black male, you got immediately about 20% more added to your uh, sentence. And if you were white, uh, made a bit brouhaha in, in the US, was a driver for rethinking of what fairness means. Uh, but the type of fairness uh, that we are dealing here with is again a different type of fairness than the one under data protection law. It is the right to be heard. 
the right to challenge and cross-examine your accuser, the right to counsel. I'm not informed. I need a legal expert under these circumstances. The right to an open trial and the right to an explanation. So again, depending on the area you are working in, the fairness requirements, the legal fairness requirements might be very, very varied. And uh, what is fair for the purpose of fair trial is most certainly very different from what is fair for the purpose of data protection law. And with that, uh, I finish. Thank you. <clears throat> Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, and there you get into a really, really interesting territory, and I totally agree with you. We are sometimes making the mistake that we are alert to the danger of something that is new and different, and we are habituated to the old dangers, and we downplay the old risk, and we exaggerate the, the new risk. In that specific case, uh, it's difficult to say. It's difficult to find robust comparison data. The reason people are nonetheless concerned about is a twofold. The first reason is, and that is something I indicated under fair trial, if you have reasons to believe your judge is biased, there are tools, me mechanisms, procedures to challenge him. You can say, look, here's a photograph of this judge in a weird white uh, bedding with uh, eyes cut out and uh, setting across a, a place on, on, on a lawn. I have good reasons to distrust this man. Uh, and because we know that judges are sometimes biased, that can then be investigated. When people challenge the algorithm, the first answer they got was, that is science and objective and mathematics, so it can't be biased. And when they finally got to the point to say it might just be biased, the uh, owner said, Oh, well, it might be biased, but it is mine. It is uh, proprietary. So you are not allowed to cross-examine and challenge it. Um, so it was easier in our legal system to challenge the human decision maker. And that is one of the reasons why we should be more concerned about this. And the other is, uh, yes, humans also make these mistakes. But with them, again, we know what to do. Uh, these days, they do get sensitivity training. They are educated. They are made aware of this in a way that doesn't happen yet automatically on the uh, algorithm design AI stage. If you are a judge, you have to take certain courses. Some of them will deal with implicit biases. We don't have that yet on the level of AI. But in principle, I think your point is absolutely right. Yeah, there's... <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.